2019 City Council meeting. Could you please stand for the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Mayor Fallendorf? Here. Vice Mayor Oliveira? Here. Council Member Herman? Here. Council Member Brolio? Here. And Council Member Matilde is absent. We have a quorum. Okay. Uh, approval of the agenda. Is there any council member that wish to make any changes to the agenda? Okay. Is there any public comment? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'll motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Number three, public comment. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the council on matters not on the agenda. State law prohibits the city council from acting upon matters not listed. Is there any public comment? Hello, good evening. My name is Isabel Moncada, and I live here in the city. I am coordinating this year's Whiskerino event, which is hosted by the Calaveras County, Calaveras County Friends of the Fair. It's on Saturday, April 6th at Frogtown, and I just wanted to um, let you all know about it, hope that you can attend, and um, same thing for everyone in the audience. Is that not on? Am I getting you louder? Okay, so same thing for everyone in the audience. April 6th, Whiskerino, um, out at Frogtown, and I hope that you can all attend. Where can you buy tickets? You can buy tickets online at friends of the Calaveras County Fair dot org, or um, you can get in touch. Amanda knows how to get in touch with me, and I can get tickets to you. And tickets are twenty five dollars a person, or two hundred and thirty for a table of ten. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Mm. Nope. Okay, moving on. Mm -hmm. Uh, earlier this evening, we went into closed session um, on three items. One item that was listed on the regular agenda was pulled. Um, item A and B, um, both with, both items uh, direction was given to staff. Item C, conference with real property negotiators regarding property disposition, um, we pulled that from the agenda. Moving on to oath of office, I will now turn it over to Stephen. There he is. And the police team for mm -hmm. I don't know how you guys are. Good evening, Council. Um, I would like to introduce uh, our new police officer with the Angels Camp Police Department. A lot of people here probably know him for, since he's a local boy, Officer Robert Mancata. Um, Robert graduated from Bret Hart High School. He then went into the Air Force. Uh, after he went into the Air Force, he came back home and started a trucking business for a while, decided he wanted to do something different, started working <coughs> with the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department as a uh, custodial deputy for a couple years. Three years. Three years. And uh, then Angels Camp Police Department had an opening and he had a desire to become a police <coughs> officer. He put him, or we put him through the police academy. He graduated the academy. He actually graduated number one in academics in his whole class. Uh, how many students? 52. 52 yeah. students. Yeah. So we're very proud to have uh, Robert and excited to have him as part of our team now. Uh, he's currently in field training and has been for the last, what, three weeks with uh, FTO Chris Johnson, and he's doing an excellent job so far. I'll let Susan come in and do the rest. Okay. 
I, Jesus Robert Moncada, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That will bear to, true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Discharge the duties which I'm about to upon upon, upon to enter. <laughs> That's close. Close enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, um, if you don't know me, uh, you will get to know me. I, uh, Angels Camp is my hometown, and I could uh, honestly say that I love this town, and I'm so happy to be able to uh, serve and protect it. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can take a break if they'd like to take yeah, pictures. Like what, a ten, five minute, ten minute break? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, we'll take a break while you, oh. if you guys want to take pictures. Okay. Let the chief do that. Okay. I'll let his okay. family member do that. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Chloe? Oh, cute. Oh, nice, Chloe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Push it in real hard. <laughs> 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 Huh? Motion without objection. Uh, motion without objection. It is so moved for me. I make a motion. So, yeah. yeah. Move second. It I'll <laughs> second it. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So put them on in. Are you here? I'll get through okay. a little bit of high energy, so I'll get through <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll bring in energy. Okay. So. Has he not graduated top of the class? Yeah. He <laughs> 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 no <out>. comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as the, the police chief and a member of our uh, the Turlock Police Department Canine Association, um, we went to the public asking for donations so that we could gather funds in order to purchase a new police dog um, to replace Cato, who retired with Chief Fordall when he left. Um, thanks to this very giving community, we were able to do so very quickly um, in gathering the money to be able to purchase the dog and pay for the training necessary to get him certified. Um, I'm happy to say, and I probably should have shared this with you a while ago, 
I know there was a question asked about how long it would be. He actually got through the training very quickly. Um, he's got very high drives, very excited, lots of energy. Um, so he's been certified since the end of December um, and been available on the streets for calls for service since then. Uh, he's still got a lot of work to do because he is so high energy. Um, Belgian Malinois, which is what he is, are known to be, um, they call them Maligators sometimes <laughs> because they're just so so high energy and, and that's not a bad thing when you're talking about a police dog. Um, but it's my recommendation and, and with the approval of the our board from the Canine Association, we'd like to donate Ryder to the City of Angels Camp um, to be part of our part of the city and part of the department. I think that's what we need to do. You can make a motion to accept, and then uh, we will <coughs> swear in the dog. Okay. Is there a motion to accept? I'll move so to moved. accept. Okay. Um, well, just one of tell us. me who. It was Joe moved. Joe, Joe moved. moved. Okay. And then uh, I'll do second. second. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Go for I'll it. I'll go get him. <laughs> <laughs> trained in patrol apprehension searches narcotics um, no longer marijuana because that's kind of a uh, we, there's issues with that legally these days so <laughs> we don't want to uh, do anything illegal by searching something that's um, allowable so he's certified in uh, cocaine methamphetamine and heroin uh, to find all of that so as you can see he's a uh, Full of energy and would yeah. like to go chase something right about now. <laughs> he's got a very high uh, high toy drive. He's social but not super social. He'll come by people and they can touch him, but he's not super interested in uh, in playing with people. But he loves his toy. <laughs> he's a boy. So that's Ryder. Okay. Okay. Plots. Ryder does solemnly swear. Ryder does solemnly swear. the Constitution of the United States. That he will. I'm sorry. Support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies foreign and domestic. Against all enemies foreign and domestic. That he will bear true faith and allegiance. That he will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, and that he will well and faithfully, and that he will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the City of Angels Police Department, dispatch the duty of duties of the City of Angels Police Department to the best of his ability. To the best of his ability. Congratulations, Ryder. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> 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 
Jack Lynch, 600 Selkirk Ranch Road. I'd like to talk about item 6A, which is the minutes from the uh, last city council meeting. And the city council meeting of February 19th. Uh, in the minutes under item on the 8A, it says that uh, Jack Lynch and Bert Sobon spoke, quote, about a uh, about an ongoing rate study. But we, we did not speak about that at all. Uh, I'd like the records to show that we spoke about a request for the city council to schedule a workshop on the proposed water and wastewater projects uh, with the intent of, of a proper public forum to discuss the $17 million program. But, w but I did not talk about an ongoing rate study. I've got a uh, write-up of that to give to the city. March 5th, 2019, council, City Council meeting minutes of February 19th. Under item 8A, please correct the minutes to show that Jack Lynch, Lynch and Bert Sobon spoke about a request for the council to schedule a workshop on the proposed water and wastewater projects with the intent of a proper public forum to discuss the $17 million program. We did not discuss the ongoing rate study. Jack Lynch. I'd move to approve item C, amended to include Jack's, uh, Jack Lynch's statement. Would that be item A? A. a. Yeah. yeah. Six I'm a. sorry, A. 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 Be on. I don't know, I know if it's on. They're on. Are they on? Well, they're, they're, they're more for recording than to. Oh. We can speak up. Let's speak up. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're Agenda item seven. Agenda. A presentation by Drake Halligan and Associates on the city regional transportation project. Great. I'm excited to introduce Matt. If you haven't had a chance to meet Matt before, 
Matt is with Drake Haglin and Associates, and he is working on several transportation projects <coughs> through Caltrans within our city limits. There's been a substantial amount of work completed by Matt and his team within the last year, so we are really excited to bring to you an update of that work. And I'll turn it over to Matt. All right. <coughs> oh, we can pull that down. Matt, when oh, you can see it. Oh, yeah, Amy's got it. There you go. There we go. As I said, I'm going to be able to give half a presentation <laughs> with my half a screen shown there. Um, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member, Staff. Uh, I'll, I'll speak up loud because I don't know if the microphone works, but I'll talk loud for everyone. This is, um, I was, wasn't expecting to have to follow a really tough act of a, the, the police dog being sworn in. I, this is not quite as exciting or, or fun as lighthearted, but uh, I am excited to be here. Um, we are working on three different transportation projects for the City of Angels Camp, and these projects are not motorized projects. These projects are all how to get you better around town walking or bicycling. Um, so it's kind of exciting to talk about these projects and forgot the logistics of this. Um, the three projects we're here to talk about tonight are the State Route 49 sidewalk infill and bike lanes project, and there's two segments of that. Um, one is between um, Stanislaus and Bragg, and the second one is between State Route 4 and the 449 intersection, essentially, and then Stockton Road. Um, the other project here to talk about is the Angel Cam Angels Camp Trails project. The Angels Camp Trails project, the goal of that one is, is again, building off of the Trails Master Plan um, that your council had approved years back. Uh, this project is starting to implement that. That Trails Plan really looked at the neighborhoods surrounding downtown Angels Camp and how to get people from those neighborhoods, not in vehicles, to the downtown better. And then the third project uh, here to talk about is, is improvements along Murphy's Grade Road and sidewalk improvements along there. So just to orient you with the sidewalk, that's a really small graphic. So let's, let's zoom in. I was trying to give you just a really broad overview of where the two sidewalk infill projects are along State Route 49. But the first one, as you can see, is along the west side of the west side of State Route 49, and that's the 449 intersection you see there on the left. And so the sidewalks are actually there on the uh, west side of the street where there currently aren't sidewalks going down uh, almost to Monteverde there. Again, continuing down um, all the way on the west side down to Stockton Road, um, filling in the sidewalk areas where there currently aren't sidewalks. And then as you get down on the other side, we're over now over on the east side, um, of course by Stanislaus on that east side where there currently aren't sidewalks extending all the way down to Bragg Street um, through there. So this project is exciting for a number of reasons. One, it's, it's filling in sidewalk gaps, which is nice, which allows better pedestrian connectivity. We're going to be including bike lanes along there as well. And the probably the most exciting thing about this project is it's funded. And it's funded through sources. Um, the city, in, in cooperation with the uh, Council of Governments, went after a competitive <coughs> statewide, what they call an active transportation grant. Um, this project was originally estimated to cost probably around about $1.8 million. And they were successful in obtaining a grant to, to build this project. Um, the unfortunate thing, or fortunate thing, I guess, unfortunate from my perspective is it's part of being competitive for that grant is we have to get this project ready for construction fairly quickly. And that was part of the condition of being competitive for this grant. Um, so we've been moving forward pretty quick. We completed our environmental clearance on this project, which was, was fairly straightforward in uh, December of this last year. We're currently working on some final plans. The outreach component for this is, is going to be important. And for this one, as well as Murphy's Grade, uh, we've been working in, in conjunction with Destination Angels Camp and Debbie in particular as kind of our um, uh, person in between to work with the residents and get these folks in. It's worked out very successfully. On Murphy's Grade Road, we've been able to meet with uh, pretty much all the property owners on that one and run design by them. We're at a point now in the sidewalk project where I was just talking to Debbie before the meeting today about this. that. 
we're going to be reaching out to these folks over the next three weeks to sit down with them with the design to make sure that this design works for them, any concerns they have. Um, after we do that, we'll probably shoot for about the third week of April and we'll hold a public open house where we'll have, uh, we'll have each of the properties, we'll have nice graphics, a little more information on there. Property owners are more than welcome to come, ask questions, and um, take a look at the overall projects at that point. Um, this project, though, will be moving forward into construction either late this year or um, we may make a decision to bid it late this year and then actually start construction in the spring of 2020. Um, the reason being that if we get started too late this year and we end up cutting a contractor season in half, so we, uh, the, the cost goes up with that because the contractor then has to stop in the middle of the winter then mobilize again next spring. It's usually more efficient if we can get a contractor out there in one shot. So we'll, we'll make that decision as we get a little later this year depending on where that construction season falls. Um, but this is pretty exciting because this, this project is completely funded and it will go to construction. The second project here to talk about is the Angel Camp, Angels Camp Trails. And if many of you recall, the trail master plan had a number of different ways of getting folks, at least from, um, from Kurt Drive down over to the uh, 4 Vallecito intersection. It had a number of different ways, and so on that colorful, those colorful lines were different ways of getting folks down there. Now, um, in the past, past um, staff that we'd worked with in Angels had met with some of the property owners in the red alignment and orange alignment that you see up there. Um, I, I'm not sure there was necessarily a lot of support for those alignments, and as we start getting into the, um, those alignments actually go down into the creek area. And then the ones, the red that goes from the Stelt Park um, development, that actually goes across a private court, some private property through there. Mm -hmm. And so when we started looking at it from an environmental standpoint, from an engineering feasibility standpoint, um, it's likely that those alternatives will likely get screened out. They're not as feasible as what you see there is a purple and the yellow, which follows along Valcito. Those are likely better choices, and not only um, from engineering and environmental, but from a user standpoint, we like to keep people as visible as possible. It makes them feel comfortable using trails and, and pedestrian ways instead of hiding them back by the creek behind trees. And so that's another factor that we look at when we try to um, look at these different alternatives. But these will be vetted in the environmental process, which we are kicking off right now. Um, I want to talk to you also, part of the project ha has a component of creating a park and ride facility. Um, what I'm going to show you, by the way, I want to preface this, these things that I'm showing you, these are not plans, these were just concepts that were initially thrown out, but I thought I'd show them to you just so you understood some of the things we've, we've looked at. Um, the park and ride facility, the location, I want to be clear about this, the location has not been determined. We are still looking at other locations. One of the locations potentially was using Tryon Park and creating a, um, using the existing foundation facility that was already there in that, in that area uh, for building a transit center which would have bathrooms, showers, parking, park and ride facility. Um, that was certainly one idea. Uh, but there are some other locations that we're evaluating as well. We have some areas along Valcito that get very narrow um, through there. And they're a little bit challenging. And you can see this one. There's the, the uh, oak tree on the left there. which, And then you have uh, slopes on the right, which may not be able to get the trail through there. So we looked at some different options through there of potentially widening on the other side of the street a little bit, taking a little bit on that side, while also widening um, towards the creek side a little bit to be able to get a trail through there. Now, your trail master plan has it as what we call a class one trail. What that means, class one is separated from the roadway. What I'm showing here is a little different. This is what we call a class four. And a class four uh, is, what, th what that means is you have the, <coughs> bi the bicyclists separated from the pedestrians. And that's why, it's, it's green, by the way. We're not planning on painting it green. I just, um, I just it's there to really highlight the difference, differential between <coughs> the bikes and pedestrians. But the point is utilizing one of the best resources you have. I mean, the creek is just, you know, it's nice to walk along the creek, along the side of the road there. So we wanted to put the pedestrians and the bikes closer to there 
the vehicles further away from that. And so this is just one of the alternatives that we looked at on that. There is an existing park and ride facility here. Um, again, trying to figure out how you take the pedestrians through here. Either you keep them along the road and leave this as is, or maybe there's a potential to reconfigure that park and ride and keep the pedestrians and bikes along the creek while con reconfiguring that area. And I, we would lose a few parking spots in there, which we'd have to try to recover those spots either further to the north, or, or I guess that would be the um, east. Um, up up Valcito, there's some area that we potentially could get some spots in there. And then we get towards uh, the intersection, Valcito and Four, and then we run into, of course, the construction. The bridge that's there now, the sidewalks are extremely narrow. Um, it's, it's not really that conducive for bicyclists or pedestrians. And so we're, we're trying to look at a different way of getting pedestrians across there without having to rebuild the bridge. And it, we took a look at, you can fit a prefabricated pedestrian bridge um, across there. And we do believe it would fit, and it would be a nice way to really be a nice entry into the downtown area. And we looked at some different aesthetic things on the pedestrian structure as well. You could even do some arches over the pedestrian um, gateways there, welcome to you know historic Angels Camp or, or some <coughs> other things. Um, and that's very cost effective as well. So then once we get, I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of working my way, um, I'm working my, my way west or, or south in this case. And as we get down to the intersection, we're going to have to look at different ways of getting pedestrians across that intersection. Um, the intersection just with vehicles is probably confusing enough for folks to get across there, let alone get pedestrians across. So there's, there's a number of ways and things we can look at to do that. Um, they're pretty cost effective. And I know <coughs> Caltrans for years has been looking at different ways to get folks across this intersection as well. Uh, once we get past the intersection, the other, the other point of this project was connecting the Greenhorn Creek development to the downtown. And that would be through Finnegan Lane. As many of you know, Finnegan Lane is narrow. It's, it's very narrow through there. Um, but the good thing is there's not a lot of traffic on it. It's fairly low speed traffic. And so this um, was really identified in your master plan as a potential to what we call a class three um, bike lane through here. Class three, what that means is that the bikes and vehicles share the same lane. And so all throughout there, you, you accomplish this by using what we call sharrows. Um, you see one in the diagram on the, on the bottom left there. Um, there's also signage that goes along with it. So then there's opportunities here, I think, also to take advantage of really advertising and really promoting the historic nature of downtown with some signs, signage and everything with this as well. The one area that we're going to have to do some property owner outreach for is as we get to the end of, or towards the end of Finnegan Lane, and we try to make that connection across to Greenhorn Creek, um, that becomes private property. Mm -hmm. So that is one where we need to uh, sit down with those property owners and discuss whether there's an interest in allowing us to potentially acquire some um, easement of sorts for pedestrians and bikes to be able to get through there um, and make that connection. So this project is a lot, is not on the same time frame uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but we, right now, have been coordinating with Caltrans <coughs> to kick off the environmental. Um, we have done that. We've started the environmental phase, uh, which means we're essentially kicking off our technical studies that we need to do. We anticipate that this spring um, that we'll start doing some one-on-one -on -one meetings with some of the uh, stakeholders, the downtown groups, the business groups, some of the property owners that are affected. We'll start doing some one-on-one -on -one meetings with the hopes that during the summer, um, we're ready to do a larger public open house on this project and share, share these ideas with the public and get some feedback on that. Um, this project is not funded. Um, right now, our rough estimates are between six and eight million dollars. Uh, what is funded for this project right now is the environmental is fully funded and the 65 percent design, and in some cases to 100 percent design for some of the smaller pieces is funded. Um, which is good because our goal is to get this project, environmental clearance on this project is probably about a year and a half process. And that's good. We'll, we'll get that done, get the design sh essentially what we call shovel ready. 
And that's going to allow the city and the COG to really compete for the pots of money that are out there. Um, believe it or not, six to eight million dollars, although it's, it's a lot of money, in, the, in what we've seen in other jurisdictions in California, that's within the ability for this jurisdiction to compete for at the statewide ATP, um, the active transportation program. So, and then I know um, Amber and I have been talking about some other programs that are available to us to compete for as well for some grant programs. But the best way we can compete for those right now, today, we wouldn't even be able to compete for those because in order to compete, you have to be shovel ready with your environmental and your design far enough along. We've done enough outreach. Um, those are all the things that it, they'll make the project um, fundable. A question for you? Yes. Uh, environmental and 65% of design, what's the order of magnitude or how much money are we talking about for that other 35% for design? So I believe the the total contract on that one I believe is 600 and some odd thousand dollars. The environmental is actually a good portion of that. Um, the design effort uh, taking, depending on what the alternative is, um, the design is probably not the lion's share of that. It's not for the, especially for like, I'll give you an example, um, Finnegan Lane doing Sharrows and the signs, that design is easy. Um, that's not very costly. The, even the prefabricated pedestrian bridge, we don't design that. We design the foundations on it and we, we purchase a prefabricated bridge that gets put in there. Um, the only areas in the design that get a little more costly are when we start doing things along Valcito, where we have to widen along Valcito, that gets a little more um, intricate on the design side, but it's really the environmental in this case um, that's going to drive a lot of that. Where do you see this missing money coming from? It's so, a so the the missing money we see on this one um, right now, Calaveras Council of Governments has programmed, um, I believe, four hundred thousand dollars a year of congestion management air quality funds towards this project. So, in theory, four years from now, um, twenty twenty two, when we're potentially or 2023, when we're potentially ready for construction, um, there would be 1.6 million of that <coughs> uh, congestion management funds there. The rest of the funding, we would be looking for the state's um, active transportation program. And with the passing of Senate Bill 1, um, the gas tax, that uh, has really increased the pot of money for programs such as the active transportation program and a number of other state programs that we may be able to compete for. So we, we think that if you make this project fit those criteria, um, it should compete well. And I think the main criteria we're looking at on this one is not only making it so that folks from neighborhoods have access to areas that they use, the downtown, without having to get in their cars, but also the park and ride is a key component of this, of again, allowing people to get to a park and ride facility and again, get out of their single vehicle, single driver vehicles and into buses and other things to get where they need to go. So those are the components of this project that we're trying to really enhance to, to make it compete. I have a question about the bicycle routes. So I was wondering, seems like i don't know how many bicycles bicyclists you know come down 49 and from four and are the, and so are the ones from four are they able to bicycle along four and when they come down 49 i can see some difficulties so i just wonder practicality wise mm -hmm. you know aren't there areas where they have to just sort of wing it Yes. Right now, <laughs> like, yeah, well, oh, the, here we go. Well, there, are, well, there definitely is. Don't hit I, me, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I was wondering, you know, practically, we have this route, but can we extend that as time goes on? Can we mm -hmm. build on that? That's the question. Yeah, we, we, we well, you definitely can build on the route. Um, yeah. It's so f along four. Four is a controlled access expressway for Caltrans, so I'm not entirely sure um, that bikes are. Okay. legal on for I was wondering. Um, but 49 they certainly are yeah and so for us it was looking at okay so the sidewalks was the main component of getting folks you have destinations such as the corner where Starbucks is and other things where people <coughs> or destination points where people need mm -hmm. to go you also have of course Bret Hart high school over there where mm -hmm. um, getting getting kids from the other side of four down 49 
to those destinations. That was, those were all key components of this project, but um, the bike, extending mm -hmm. your bike routes beyond that, I'm not sure where your master plan, how far yeah. it goes. And you have the person. annex and, you know, you're gonna get hit along that on 49. I just wondered, yeah, I mean, you have to build, extend and take away s street space when maybe there'll be very few bicyclists on that, like on uh, Vallecito. Mm -hmm. So. The, in this case, though, we're not widening, the, the street space is already there. Okay. Um, so it's, if you, as you drive down 49, it's a very wide um, width out there, and the Caltrans right-of-way is already widened for that for the most mm -hmm. part. So um, it, it is part of their plan as well, Caltrans plan for 49 to make it a, what they call a complete street, mm -hmm. which would include a yes. different way for, instead of just for vehicles, uh, for bikes, pedestrians, mm. everyone to use. So. Um, this is consistent with Caltrans plans as yeah. well. I mean, so you think that this could all happen, a complete possibility in the future that all of that would, you'd have room for the bicycles and the sidewalks? Do you think that's but, something that could happen? Well, that's something that's going with this project. We're, we're including, with this project in those areas that we're, um, that we're doing, we're including the bike lanes, right. the width through there, as well as the sidewalk. So yes, yes, I know. Mm. I just was wondering if Caltrans is, I don't know, I just seem like a lot of our streets are narrow, so it just yeah. seemed difficult. Th this one, yeah, 49 is a little different in that it is just wider like that, and that's what it kind of goes back to um, this, the City of Angels camp uh, worked on a project for the Gateway Project, right? Mm -hmm. And you looked at and you looked at 49, and w what did you really want for 49? And I think I heard from a number of folks, Melissa, Amber, and others who participated in that process, that a lot of folks said, we don't want to see a big wide sea of pavement out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we want it broken apart. And so there, your plan calls for landscaping along mm -hmm. the back of the sidewalk, right. separating sidewalks, and that's incorporated into this project as well. Um, that's not a Caltrans standard, so that's something we're working through with them. Um, but their support of Caltrans was part of that process as well, and they're supportive of completing this complete street project right. and also in taking into account the, c the City of Angels camp, your master plan for that as well, which is oh, yeah. going on. Well, I know all that's there. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering practically if it, you know, especially when you hit the annex, you know, I don't know. Just, you know. So, and I, I think that the limits of these, all of these projects so far don't go to that far south. <coughs> stop at the Valcina Road and 49 intersection. Mm -hmm. Then the connection becomes more recreational beyond the Finnegan Lane Greenhorn Creek connection mm -hmm. and the tie-in becomes Maloney's Lake. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes the recreational component. So we look yeah. at this part in this phase being funded with congestion mitigation air quality mm -hmm. is to really increase active transportation circulation within mm -hmm. our three mile community radius and get people out of their cars from the subdivisions within our community and connect those points of interest that Matt laid out to mm -hmm. those people within their community. Then the recreational mm -hmm. component, which would be something mm -hmm. that we hope we can draw people from the outside of our community in and then provide them the parking facilities whereby they can access those recreational trails and have that be kind of a tourism mm -hmm. visitor amenity. We don't have the recreational component at all funded for environmental or design mm -hmm. and um, that's still going to require a lot more work. Uh, well, we're, we're kind of thinking of the trail that goes behind and then to Malonis, right? And that's mm -hmm. where the, the oh, bicyclists okay. could continue on that path? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that's part of yeah. the bigger plan. Yeah. We don't have the funding I and uh, congestion mitigation air quality CMAC mm -hmm. is specific um, and it does not include the recreational components of these types of projects. Okay. All right, All right. Thank you. Okay, now I understand what you're asking on that one. Yes, the the recreational component, and we did and we did look at that one quite a bit, Melissa. You remember back, um, but there are certainly challenges with that one of getting down to New Malone. <coughs> uh, the uh, Bureau of Recl Reclamation was was a little bit difficult on that one. And mm -hmm. They they we still they, they still want to figure out how to collect their fees out of here. <laughs> <laughs> we won't give up. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you for just so, so. looking, you know, oh, no problem. get some answers just to analyze it, right? So, so the third project um, that we're here to talk about is Murphy's Grade Road, and, and this is a really big exhibit, so you can probably see it as well as I can, uh, but <laughs> it's, it's a large area. It goes along Murphy's Grade Road. Um, really the heart of this project is really in front of the high school and has a lot to do with improving access um, along the front of the high school there. 
And so we've coordinated, and again, through Destination Angels Camp, uh, I believe we've met with every property owner affected by this project in that stretch now. Um, and heard some very positive feedback from, from all of them about the project, including the high school. Um, they didn't like the plans, so we will be connecting the sidewalks through there, providing sidewalk connections on both sides of the street, all the way up uh, Murphy's Grade Road, and adding a new connection across at, um, oh gosh, that is, Demers, thank you. That project um, is, is interesting because we've been talking about different ways and what, how these projects will get funded. And we talked about the trails project, that that project is, is really more for the air quality of getting people out of their cars. Um, this project is probably going to compete well for what used to be the old Safe Routes to Schools program, um, because this will enhance the ability and safety of kids walking to and from school along that stretch. Um, so I, this project is really a great candidate for that. It's, we did complete the environmental clearance for that as well in December. Uh, we've conducted all the property owner meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings. The public open house that I mentioned before and that we're thinking about the third week of April, that will be joint with Sylvia Murphy's Grade Road as well as the Angel Sidewalk projects I showed you. It'll be both those projects at this open house. Um, that, this one's very similar. We've, we've produced plans to about a 65% level of completion. We anticipate that by probably about October of this year, we'll be done, pencils down, the plans will be complete. Um, at that point, it'll be up to us, um, city and the COG, to go out and compete for funding to construct this. Um, right now, the estimate looks a little high. It's at 2.6 million for construction. Um, the reason it's so high on that one, right now at this level where we're at, we have a 25% contingency in there. So you can imagine, do the math, that's about 500 plus thousand dollars of contingency is built into this. Um, so the number probably is closer around 2 million, but we, it is a little higher right now just because of the unknowns of where we are in the design phase. But that estimate by the time October comes around, we usually take our contingency down to a 10% contingency because we have a higher level of confidence in, in the plans at that point, the estimates. So with that, um, I think that's all three projects. I'll take any other questions you have. So the shovel-ready idea, that's what you're saying, is going to be October 19th? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and the, and the Murphy's grade one, um, I, you know, we've been coordinating with the school on that one, and I, I, I think, um, that it's ideal if we construct this one, as soon as school is out, we'll turn a contractor loose and have it all done before they get back in. So this is probably good that we finish this year, late this year, it gives us time to go after some grant money, hopefully obtain it. Um, if we had the funds to go to construction, the ideal time would be, unfortunately it would be February of 2020, would be the ideal time to bid this, so that we have a contractor on board and ready to go come May, May. in May, late May when school is out. Um, so, so we are working, I know Amber's working on, we're all looking at different funding opportunities on that one, but um, if the money came a little later, well, we'd probably work with the school and figure out a way to still get out there to construction anyways. We're probably not going to turn down money if the state offers it to us for this project. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or uh, comments from the council before I turn it over to public comments? Not here. Yes. Is there any public comments? Good evening, Christopher Clerk, uh, 671 Casey Street, um, here in Angels Camp. Just a quick question, something that came up. I may have missed it. I apologize. Um, you talked about basically through uh, Highway 49, um, the projects would be connecting essentially from destination Starbucks, right, all the way to Bragg Street. Wondering if you had any plans for from Bragg Street down to downtown, so that would be, um, you know, 49 um, along Utica Park. That whole area seems like that would be a pretty critical area to have. So just a question about if there's plans for that. So, so ultimately, the answer is ultimately yes. Um, with this project, what we had to look <coughs> at was this ATP round of funding, uh, the active transportation program that we got the funding under, it, in order to compete for this, they had this 
leftover money at the end there, and they said, okay, jurisdictions, you can compete for this, but here's your criteria. You have to be shovel ready within the next year, all these different things. And so we looked at what was the easiest stretch that we could bite off that we know we could get into construction in time and compete for this money because it was going to be a one-time opportunity. Um, the stretch that, that you're, you're talking about is definitely part of the plan. Unfortunately, that's going to take a little more work on the environmental, on the engineering side. There's a lot more challenges um, with that one, so we wouldn't be able to quite, we, wouldn't, we weren't confident that we could accelerate that one uh, for the grant funding. But there's, you know, like I said, I, I hate to be overly optimistic about it, but with the, the gas tax in place, it has a lot, it, it really has infused a lot of money into a lot of these different programs. And so it's not, you know, a hundred jurisdictions competing for scraps now. There's actually some meat in there to actually compete for. Um, so I think as long as we get our projects shovel ready and they meet the criteria of what they're looking for, I think we have good opportunities to get projects funded in the future. Thank you. I'm happy to have this item before you so that we can award our city engineer's contract. Uh, December 7th, we had received proposals from five very qualified engineering firms. We've assembled a review panel and committee, and that committee <coughs> unanimously recommended Drake Haglin and Associates to serve in the capacity of our city engineers. Uh, Matt is a member of Drake Haglin and Associates. He works on the design and, and engineering side of that division, but we will be staffed by two employees from Drake Haglin, Jennifer Maxwell, and then Dave Richards. Jennifer Maxwell will be um, fulfilling the engineering component for transportation projects for us in-house, and then Dave Richards will be serving in the capacity of water and wastewater. So I'm happy to make this recommendation to support the award of our city engineering contract to Drake Haglin and Associates. Is there any questions or comments from the council? Yes. Okay. Um, I, the references that I saw in here were mostly related to projects, a lot of them that were have been done here, as I recall. So I'm curious um, what other references we have, you know, other cities, does Sonora use them, does Jackson use them, that kind of thing. I mean, if it's buried in there, I apologize, I didn't see it. No, not at all. So uh, with the proposals, each of the applicants had provided us with references with similar engineer, air engineering um, services that they've provided for other cities, like cities or bigger cities. So I did contact several of those references uh, received within those proposals. It's not in this document. Um, it's attached to the proposal submitted by Jerry Caglin, but all of the references came back highly favorable of each of the members proposed for this team. Okay. Can I keep going? Uh, on the deliverables, um, I don't see page numbers, but I'm looking at task one, sure. general city engineer services, and then at the bottom it's 1890 deliverables. Uh, a lot of that stuff is pretty critical for the city, so I'm wondering about timelines and what kind of detail um, can be provided in short order about timelines for those for some of those key projects. I can work with them to get a deta detailed timeline um, and more detailed list of deliverables uh, for those items. Uh, we did discuss the scope and they were not concerned with the deliverables required uh, within that fiscal year, but I can get more information from both Jennifer and Dave as it pertains to that scope. Okay. Yeah, I'd I just think that lines up well to understand what the commitments are to get some of those more important things done okay. that are high on our priority list. Um, are there uh, specifics that you'd really like to be elevated? Well, my eye jumps to water, wastewater, okay. you know, right, the number one item on there, there's some key issues that 
and uh, did I see capital improvement programs in here too and things like that okay that yes we've sorely needed for a while okay and then on uh, task uh, task two and three do I understand that correctly that those things are end up expense revenue neutral to the city these are grant pursued kinds of things or developer funded kinds of things uh, this should be <coughs> expense neutral for us in terms of the cost of the full-time city engineer so those are the items that are covered within those basic engineering services and then anything beyond <coughs> that would be a task order change so if we are successful in getting grants and then we are adding on components of their work not covered <coughs> within those general city engineering services we would come back to you make you aware of the opportunity let you know of the added scope and then we would do a task order change to complete that specific project. But each of those we would bring to you as the opportunity comes forward. The same with the water and the wastewater. Okay. Um, physical presence. It's stated that the office location is down in uh, Rancho, mm -hmm. Cordova. But, but it's important, I think, for the engineer to have a face in the community. So are they going to be in the office a couple days a week, as Amy is, or how are we going to work that? So I think that's still to be determined. Uh, I think for me, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that the physical pre pre presence is important to you. Um, for me, I saw a lot of heavy lifting and the technical work that, that I needed them to do, um, and then had to anticipate them coming out for community meetings and council meetings. So that's going to be a conversation I'll need to have with them in terms of what their level of expectation is in terms of being in the office on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, and then I am also looking at my existing engineer tech position. Um, that's becoming a very valuable position and it's one that I see potential for being a liaison and a coordinator to these higher level engineers and the on the ground work that we do within our community. So that's also an option that I'm exploring right now. Is there a preference that you have, though, for a minimum amount of time that you would expect within the community? I was okay. thinking because of the experience with Amy and her physical mm -hmm. presence, one or two days a week would be appropriate. Um, but it depends on what the activity is, the activity level for engineering is that's going on, I suppose. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want it just to be nobody's here yeah. ever. You pick up the phone and they're down in Rancho and you don't even know what they look like. So. Right. Right. So I think what I anticipate is when they've got a lot of technical work that can be done from their office, that's great. Um, when we have an inspection that needs to be done, for example, on our wastewater treatment Title 22 replacement project, that's the expectation that they're on site, they're conducting that work, um, and then they're completing any other work additionally that we can get done in town. Okay. I will talk to you. Sure. So with the public interaction what they used to till now kind of what Joe said just always on the phone would that tech position be the person that the public would see and be face to face or how do you how would we I think on small some of that? yeah I think on small projects say for example you have a property owner that's concerned with runoff onto his yard and he's concerned about the street um, that could be an opportunity maybe where our engineer tech meets one-on-one -on -one and then communicates mm. to the engineers on a bigger um, scale and a bigger discussion if there's any solutions that need to be brought forward or design components that need to be incorporated into that discussion then on the other hand if it's tractor supply and we have our team meeting with the developers to review plans to go over project specifics that's one where I would expect them to be on site and meeting with those developers. Utica Hotel is another example. Mm -hmm. We meet regularly, staff meets regularly with the property owners of the Utica Hotel. That's one mm -hmm. that I would expect that they would be on board to meet with those developers. So I just think it depends on the size and the scale. Mm -hmm. If it's something manageable that our engineer can, tech can handle within his scope, then that would be the preference. I think when we look at the hourly rate of the contracted employees, you know, maximizing their time is really important to me. And so I think if it's something that our tech can accommodate, we should do that. I'd say too, just that I want to confirm, I think it's very important to have that face to face because if I hear, ever hear any criticism, it's sometime I tried to go and talk to somebody and nobody was, you know, that I could talk to. So I think that that's a very important part of this. So good. I'm glad that uh, we're getting some guidelines for that. And we're going to make it clear with the 
public, you know, let them know how this process evolves, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I, I think it'll be something that we just learn, sort of trial um, and error. I think having Kevin full time in the office is helpful. Having Jennifer full time in the office will be very helpful. Um, we're trying to rotate the days so that if they're there one day a week, it's the same time that Amy is there and our new building inspectors there, yeah. so that they could coordinate and collaborate. Uh, so we're working on those types of things. <coughs> Will it work maybe every week? I'm not sure. But I think it's something I can definitely communicate to them. And I have a feeling they might be up here more frequently in the beginning. Okay. No, that's all I have. I'm good. Thanks. Any other council questions? The 163000 per year. Is that based off of what projects we think we have coming up that they're going to tackle? That's based on what we paid our previous city engineer. Is it? Okay. So we tried to stick within the constraints of the existing budget. Okay. And then we recognized that if they are aggressive and go and pursue alternative funding, that we would provide them the opportunity to come back with a task change order and add that additional work. So we, we tried to stick within the constraints of existing. Okay. Yeah. I think that there's definitely a lot more work there, but I think it's good that we put some boundaries on that in terms of a, a realistic expectation and starting point, especially given the constraints of our budget. Any other council comments or questions before turning over to the Good. Cool. Okay. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, I will bring it back to council for a motion. I'll move to approve the contract award with Trey Kagan as uh, described and discussed in the meeting today. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 There is a reminder you took that the next item out of order, so mm -hmm. we would be on item 7D. Are we on 7D? 7D. Okay. Um, this one's been hanging around for a while. It's for our Dollar General store. When they were putting in their improvements, <coughs> they discovered that they had to actually excavate the water line down deeper than they thought they would in order to get the rest of their infrastructure in. Because they were doing that excavation, the city asked them to please upsize the water line so that it matched the water line that was feeding into it and would match what our water master plan required, the 10-inch line. Yep. Amy, Jack, were you saying you couldn't hear? So can you hear any better this way? You know, I was sitting back there also, and I was having a horrible time hearing. I don't know what's wrong with these mics. Yeah, that's <coughs> what could you? It might help to move up. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's really tough to hear back there today. I don't know why. So basically, we are, they have, uh, our prior city engineer had done an analysis of what kind of reimbursement they should be allowed to get and concluded that they should be allowed to get $21,500 based upon the length of the pipeline that they constructed, um, which means that they would get a $21,500 reimbursement from us. However, before they were able to finish their project, they discovered they could not get all of their parking spaces in. So as you'll recall, a few months ago, we established a parking in lieu fee based on all of that, the city would write a check to the developers, cross development, for $7,500 to reimburse them for the water line. The remaining $14,000 would instead go from our um, water fund into our in lieu parking fee fund. Are there any questions? So. $21,000 for making the pipe bigger. It ran the same distance, and the fact that it had to go deeper was their issue because of an infrastructure that was missed 
in engineering? Yes, they thought that they would not have to um, do any types of improvements, what have you. They were mistaken when they actually got con under construction. Otherwise, we would have had a reimbursement agreement with you long before they started doing construction. At least that's what our former city engineer had included in his memo. So, so the only the only issue for the city was make the pipe bigger, and that's it. Yes. And that was twenty one thousand bucks. Yeah. Yes, Income and the difference between six and eight or eight and twelve or whatever it was. Correct, and that's actually set in our impact fees. It actually says um, that it's a hundred dollars per lineal foot that you get reimbursed, um, and fifteen hundred dollars per valve. So that's it was straight math. Um, okay. what they would be reimbursed. Okay. They, they asked that we give them more, and we said, no, um, that's what our code says, 100 per lineal foot, 1,500 per valve. They said, okay. Okay, thanks. I got one. Mm -hmm. Since I'm new to this, what is the city's in lieu parking fee fund? It is something we established just a few months ago. It's referenced in our code that if you are unable to establish a parking space on site, you instead will pay an in lieu fee. And that fee will cover the purchase and construction of a parking space elsewhere. OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. It is approximately uh, $3,500 per parking space. In Should lieu. You? In lieu. <laughs> Thanks. There you go. Mm -hmm. Any other council questions or comments? Is there any public comment? Okay, I will bring it back to the council. I'll move approval of this item. Oh. <coughs> All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item 17, authorization of a contract for environmental services with Helix. Helix. Environmental Felix. planning. Thank you. Uh, for the city of Angel Sewer Line Collection System Improvement and Replacement Project. And the amount not to exceed 66960 and transfer an additional. Six thousand nine hundred fifty from the water fund to the wastewater fund. Amy. Okay. Um, staff is recommending that you hire Helix to perform this project. And as we discussed in the past, we basically have, in effect, a moratorium <coughs> due to the surcharging that is occurring in our wastewater collection system, basically from Booster Way and extending a large distance not quite to our wastewater treatment plant. This would upgrade, not upgrade, this would repair that system so that we would be able to continue to add um, wastewater to the system and it would actually make it all the way from the north end of town to our wastewater treatment plant. Um, we sent out a request for proposals. We received 10 proposals. We established a selection committee consisting of three people, and they unanimously recommended the hiring of Helix. Um, we had originally estimated the cost to be approximately $60,000. Um, it came in at 66690 so we were close. I will say that the costs that came in ranged from $33,000 up to $134,000. And our selection committee basically based their decision on those that were responsive to the RFP <coughs> and had the best price. In other words, the minimum requirement was you had to respond to what the RFP asked you to do, be qualified to do what the RFP asked you to do, and then they looked at the person that had the lowest price amongst those and they came up with Helix. As you will notice, um, there was a challenge to that by a company that did in fact come in um, a little less, about $8,000 less. That particular company um, 
failed to include a portion of the project. Hence, we could have gone back to them and asked them to refab their costs, and they would likely have potentially had to increase their costs. And the proposal assumptions required the submittal of a reasonably precise project objective, conceptual engineering, conceptual site plans, and feasibility studies, something that we will not have available during the environmental review process. That will come later in the process, and we, in fact, stated so in the RFP. Um, and while it wasn't a determinant factor, that particular proposal that is um, objecting to our recommendation, they exceeded the 10-page limit that everybody else complied with. Um, so basically, they provided additional information that others were not able to because they met the page limit. Um, on last Friday, I can contacted every single one of the firms that proposed to buy phone, um, talked with eight of the ten people, and today talked to the ninth. All of them were invited to go on our on-call contracting list for the city. Um, all have agreed to do so, including the firm that protested. Um, David Claycomb, I believe, from Helix is here should you have any questions about the firm that we are recommending to hire. And that was way more information than you probably needed to know, but I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, just a little background for me. Yeah. Go, oh, go ahead, Al. Oh, I, I, I want some background. So we have to do the $66,000 improvement or the $60,000 improvement for what reason? Is there sewage leaking? Is there, why are we, what are we doing with, what are we doing this project for? Okay, this was actually identified in the general plan in 2009 as yeah. something we had to do environmentally because if we keep adding development without fixing this section of the pipe, it will continue and worsen to surcharge. And what I mean by that is in the rainy season, mm -hmm. all that water comes down, Stealthy Park comes right in at a T at this one spot, and it backs up. And it actually blows the manhole covers off in some locations, and sometimes that leaks into the creek, no. <laughs> and sometimes onto the roadways. And that is not what we need to have happening environmentally. So we need to have the sizes made uniform all the way down so that they can handle that surcharge and make it all the way to the wastewater treatment plant without backing up and blowing off our manholes. Okay. So you so this is for future development or do we have No, it's a moratorium right now. Right now. Okay. And we have pending applications that will need to use this and we made a commitment to yeah, them okay, so, okay. that we would try right. to get that done within a, a year. Okay, that's mm -hmm. cool. That's what I was Yeah. Can you um, for background purposes explain what those projects are? Because I don't think some of the council members would for some of those decisions. Okay. Um, we have a pending application for up to 87 affordable housing units that would need to rely on this. Tractor Supply Project lucked out in that they had two sewer hookups already on their parcel. Right. And it's so long as you can do a net zero impact, you can proceed. We also have a 36 unit affordable housing project pending. Um, that would need to use this in order to proceed. And so there's there's multiple projects like this, especially in the north part of the city. Greenhorn Creek actually uses a different line, right. so they're not affected. Right, they come through thinning in. And so with the 66,000, how, how much more does this help us get away from the moratorium or the... Not it, it, it removes it. It removes it. It removes it. And it's important to note <coughs> our, our, water, our wastewater treatment plant already has the capacity to right. serve the development. The problem is it's the lines. getting it there. Okay. It's the collection system. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Any other questions? That. No, that's okay. I just, that raises a question for me. Sorry to drag you into the no. bushes on this. But it's, it, th this environmental piece sets the stage for future funding to actually get the work done. Correct? Yes, we actually have, we are already 
attempting to get on the list for construction funds. So this gets it to the quote shovel ready stuff. It gets it to the about. shovel ready stage. Just okay. as you heard Greg Haglin talking about getting the environmental done so that you could get the funding, we are actually going to get in line for the funding before the environmental is completed so that the day it's completed, we can start on the construction. Great. I'm good. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to go over to public. Are there any public comments? Jack Lynch, 600 Selkirk Ranch, Greenhorn Creek, Angels Camp. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's important that you understand that in, in the back of the room, they, they really can't hear the conversation. Uh, I'd like to make the observation right now that the questions I just heard by two of the council members fit exactly into the category of what uh, myself, Bert Silburn, and, and also Elaine Morris, who, who made contact with me, pleading for workshop because I think it's so important, we're facing $17 million of proposed expenditures and having a, a workshop so we can talk about the details of, of these projects, just as I heard. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in the past, and it was about $800,000 spent on replacing sewer lines uh, in Alterville Historic District, <coughs> Uh, all the way down uh, Gold Cliff, for example, was replaced. A, a lot of a lot of footage, probably about equivalent to what we're pro uh, we're talking about right here. At no time did we uh, get a uh, uh, and go through the process of the environmental uh, scrutiny that you're proposing here, where you have to have an environmental study made of the area that you're going to dig up to replace a sewer line. So I'm a little confused. Is it because you then get funding, if, if that's the case? If you're going to get funding, why are we talking about uh, uh, rate increases in the sewer if we're going to go do environmental studies, get uh, funding from the state? Why are we asking the rate payers to, on top of that, be paying uh, 17 million dollars and, and I'm, I need a little uh, explanation as to why that is uh, I, I'm absolutely in favor of the project replacing uh, uh, sewer lines no question in my mind about that but some of the technicalities I, I don't quite understand thank you <laughs> I thought you were saving me. <laughs> um, Jack is correct um, in that for our investment of $69,960, we could in fact get funding from the state to construct the project, which is the number one project in our wastewater master plan. So you could, if we are successful getting that funding, consider that as a project you no longer need to fund under your rate increase study. But to be clear, Amy, you would have to secure that funding but before you could take it out of... Correct. Yeah, the rate. Yep. Oh. Right. right. Okay. And I think often... Okay. No, oh, okay. Um, it's also an obligation to the JPA as well that we need to um, make sure that there is future funding um, to prove. So I think there's a lot of moving moving parts um, outside of this, this project that need to be addressed. And that's why we are bringing the rates studies um, to the council and potential workshop and so forth. Um, I do have an update for okay. Mr. Lynch. Now that we have our city engineer. Speak loudly. 
now that we have our city engineer contract award, uh, we hope to be having a meeting with uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, we can also meet with Mr. Soban to review the evaluation of the projects. And we may be planning that project workshop as soon as the March 19th meeting. So that's all tentative uh, based on the amount of work that our new city engineer and I can do in a pretty short period of time. But I think at the very least between now and then, uh, we would like to sometime to meet one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Lynch and go over the projects and the concerns that he has about those projects. So I think now that we have this, the, the ink drying, then we can get to work. Did you get that yeah. I, I would prefer... After, after uh, watching the video of, of the city council meeting, Elaine Morris has made contact with me. She would like very much for there be a, a public workshop open so that people, all people that are interested can uh, attend and listen to it and, and uh, understand it. Uh, she is also very concerned about the concept of, I've asked her to pass it on directly to, to, to you people. She's also very concerned about the concept of pay as you go rather than what we're hearing about tonight, getting a state grant or taking out a loan. These facilities that you're talking about are long life facilities. And if you pay as you go, that means that the people that are living here right now are paying for it in their rates. And yet the facility that we're talking about is going to have a life of 30, 40, 50 years so that it seems proper, in my mind anyway, that you would get a loan or get a grant and therefore mitigate the, the financial impact on the residents and the businesses of the city. But that's, that's uh, Elaine Morris's comments. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay, Bert Sobon, yeah, I live in Greenhorn Creek, um, and I support Jack's appeal <coughs> for more public interaction on these issues. Um, as he said, your questions led he and I to believe that you weren't quite even up to speed on some of the details where you should have been. Okay, so the public, and not everybody's going to be wanting to dig into the details, but there should be an opportunity for those who do to have it in open and discussed. And roundtable discussions tend to bring up questions you individually might not think of, but a, a, a friend or neighbor would, and you'd also be interested in that. So that's all I have to say. So, Council, um, and Jack, so we'll confirm, but I'm almost positive because I'm trying to pull it up and I can't pull it up on my computer, but um, that the, uh, for existing customer customers, it contemplates bond financing, which means that you don't pay it all up front and, th and then it gets in the rate payers. It, it's, you take out a bond, which is effectively a loan, and then that loan gets paid back over these rate increases over the 30 years of its life. So as an example, somebody who is living here today isn't paying for 100% of all of the improvements. It's paid for like a loan over a period of time. But before we have the workshop and when we're at the workshop, we'll 100% let you know and, and make sure that that's clarified because I can't confirm it, but, so I'm having to go off memory. But I want you to know that it's not like Today, if you're a rate payer, you're paying 100% to build something, and then it's done, and then whoever comes in later just gets the benefit of that. Uh, a couple of comments. Somehow, it, somehow <coughs> it's 
seems to be a general feeling that this was going to go forward without public discussion. It was never the intent. Maybe you can, and, and it was never in the plan, and in fact, in the early stages of the rate study that we all saw a couple of months ago, it was pretty clear that, you know, that was going to proceed that way. Maybe, Melissa, you could articulate just a little bit sure. about what the communications plan is for this overall thing. Sure, yeah. We do have an extensive communication plan and contract that we have approved with Destination Angels Camp for the community outreach. A bigger community workshop is planned more towards the end of that outreach strategy, whereby the beginning and middle is more small one-on-one -on -one, uh, group meetings with the community in different residential areas. I think uh, what Mr. Lynch's comments have provided me the opportunity to do is share with them a new city engineer who will be taking the time to kind of evaluate the projects in the CIP from a new perspective. I think that's worthy of starting the conversation and providing the basis by which that outreach strategy will be implemented. So um, we also received council direction from you at the previous meeting that you had seen the options for the rate studies. You gave us that direction. We want to bring that back to you and that will initiate the options and alternatives we take to the public. And that again will be the foundation of those public discussions. So uh, <coughs> Destination Angels Camp and Debbie Pawnee had outlined, I want to say dozens, it seemed like dozens of meetings throughout the community over a period of time. Um, and if we need to tap the brakes a little bit throughout the next coming months to make sure that we are inclusive of everyone and we have provided ample time, I'm committed to, to giving the community that time for that discussion. But what I hope to do um, as early as March 19th is bring to you the options that you directed at the previous discussion and then also if there is an alternative that takes into consideration a more comprehensive discussion of the projects and so we will afford that time so that the council can say yes these are the projects these are our expectations moving forward that will become part of the foundation for those community discussions and I think the way that we're working with Destination Angels Camp in partnership I think the way that we're having these conversations is allowing myself and our team to strategize and to re-strategize how to be successful with this rate study. Um, and we're able to adapt our outreach plan to take into consideration some of the comments that we're hearing. So that's, that's what we're committed to do in the beginning. Um, and as we receive more input from the community, you know, Debbie and I have talked as we engage in those one-on-one -on -one meetings, we'll bring those concerns back to you and provide this kind of discussion for what do we do about that. Um, so I, I agree that we haven't even begun the process of outreach. Could I, I wanted to ask a question of yeah. Melissa. Um, so I know there's a difference between the community meetings, I think I'm getting that clear, the community meetings and having discussion and us being sure that we have a work study session that we really understand everything. So we're going to do both, is that right? We're going to do a work study where we really understand everything yes. and then also the community later to inform. Right. Okay. Okay, Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Great. So just allow another layer of protection onto this. Yeah. There's a legally prescribed process that oh. involves lots of hearings that are required before we could do it. So even if we wanted to yeah. move quickly and be tricky, it would not be possible yeah. and still have those, those uh, rates be legally enforceable. Well, thanks. I always want to clear that up because I yeah. thought there was a perception out there mm -hmm. that there wasn't going to be any community or public discussion. Oh, okay. That's simply not the case. So. That's the work study. Any further discussion before we bring it back to council for a motion? No? Nope. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll move to approve uh, the contract with Helix as stated and presented here tonight. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I just wanted to inc uh, confirm that that included c taking the additional 6690 from the water fund. Uh, 
uh, financial report. I don't know. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Emily Orm, the finance officer for the City of Angels, and I'm here to give you a presentation um, on our finances through January. Can you talk a little bit about it? Okay. Um, <coughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Emily. So I'm going to get started. Um, first, I want to update you with some stats that I have from our new online payment system. Um, we've had 88 online payments in January. When we first started, we had 240 payments in February and um, 140 on auto pay. So that's currently 33% of our customers are using the new system. So pretty exciting for our department. Okay. Okay, so first, first I'm gonna talk about some of our major revenue sources. Um, one of the main one is uh, property tax. Um, the way that that, that is received is uh, we get about 55% of that in January, another 40% in our June payment, and then 5% in July. Um, so I'm um, projecting through the end of the year that we'll be about 8,000 over budget. We've received so far 320,000. Um, the motor vehicle license in lieu tax, um, that we received 50% in January, and then we get the rest in June, and so we've received half of that. Um, so it looks like we'll come in a bit over budget on that one. Um, for sales tax, um, I think I talk, I talk more about sales tax on my next slide, but um, it looks like we're gonna come in a little bit over budget there. And then TOT, that is, um, we receive that the month following the quarter close. And so looking at that, um, we're projected to be about 68,000 under budget for the general fund. And um, so that's for the emergency services, roads, and tourism funds. That's gonna be about 18,000 short for each of those funds. Um, and so I'm gonna get more into it as we go. That's just an overview. So here we can look at a um, historical property tax over the years. Um, the main thing that we're gonna notice here is the big drop in 2016-17. This was part of the state's uh, triple flip that they did, switching property tax for sales tax. And so that was the end of that. And so you'll see it on the next slide in sales tax that the sales tax jumps up by the same amount. So it's not like we lost a bunch of property value. <laughs> um, so then <coughs> So here's sales tax, and you can see between 15, 16, and 16, 17. 
about the jump, it kind of eases in a little bit more there. And so um, we do have a possibility of bringing in additional revenue um, with our new sales tax measure this year, but that amount uh, depends entirely on uh, the bill that we're going to owe the state, and we have not gotten any updates um, for that amount yet. Um, and then also there was a new decision, the Wayfair decision, that um, is going to help collect some tax for the e-commerce that e-commerce generates. Um, so that will also generate a little bit more sales tax in the future, but the amount at this point is not known. Maybe 25000 was a number thrown out, but um, at this point, um, we don't really have any good estimates on that. Is I have a question about those. Yeah. On the sales tax? Yeah. Um, so your projection on that is based on the seven and a quarter, just the run rate through June? Yeah, yeah, yes. They are, um, yeah, we, we have a sales tax consulting firm that helps us, uh, and they give us projections. So it's actually off of their projections that they provide us. For and it's just, and they don't, they haven't included in the new. So the if new we were to get something between April, f when do we start collecting? S April 1st? April 1st. Rate? Yeah, we will get some advances. We will. But at this point, we can just... Um, assume that that's going to cover how much we owe the state so which is a not to exceed 125,000 do we know when we're going to know how much we owe the state we don't we've, we, been, we've been emailing them and calling them Melissa and I both and they're just not in a position to give that information because they're still aggregating statewide the implementation of the measures and the associated costs so it, it depends on how many people had these measures or how many jurisdictions had sales tax measures, and then the cost is split among all those jurisdictions. I have seen some polling um, websites when I was doing my research in this that it looked like there was a lot more jurisdictions this year than the, in the preceding couple years. So and that's against a fixed base of people doing the arithmetic, so that should be better for us then? Yes, yes. We want more people to have done measures because then that's less cost for us it's spread across more evenly. But the, we can't get anything out of them. Not an estimate. They just are not willing to give us any information until they have the, the actual amount. Hopefully by next quarter when I come back with uh, third quarter, I'll have more. Okay. Yeah. And then I had a question about Wayfair. Is <coughs> Wayfair, did they decide yet if it's going county or the actual jurisdiction of the city? I think it goes straight to it goes to the actual jurisdiction to the city. Yeah, so it's not just county; it goes to where it should go. Okay, because the last of my understanding was it was county, and then it distributed to the local jurisdiction, and they were still working on that deviation. I could I could verify because I'm not I'm not 100 percent on that. I will come back with that. All right, so uh, transient occupancy tax. So this is our TOT. Um, here's our historical TOT. Um, looks like we do see kind of a peak happening in 1516 and it leveling out now around 1 million. Um, this is overall TOT across all of our funds. Um, and so we did get uh, approval from you to move forward with a potential 2% increase. So that could provide an additional 200,000 in the future. Could, could you describe for me how we pursue VRBO and things like that that aren't quite as obvious as the hotel? Um, you mean how, how we seek those those payments? Or uh, yeah, I mean, if you... If you so we, if you we have staff. The websites, we have staff. You there's 90 places here yeah. that, that are for rent, and so... How do we get those that are in the city limits, and what are we doing? Um, so our, our staff is going on those websites and reaching out to owners that are not on our on our list. Are they, favorable, are they generally responsive once we catch them? Sometimes. <laughs> I, um, I can look into an actual response rate if you like, but um, I don't know that off the top of my head. I know sometimes it's harder, and sometimes they're like, oh, I just didn't know. So you get both. <laughs> so if you really want to get compliance, you probably have to, we'd have to make some code updates to increase the penalties for non-compliance. Yes. What did that answer? You'd have to increase the penalties for non-compliance. If you really wanted people to comply. Yes. <laughs> so we will get an update on 
the number of people we catch with the VRBOs that aren't registered or have business licenses or paying TOT. Because <coughs> I think well, TAM goes for both. Yeah. That they are required to get a business license and also uh, uh -huh. the TOT contribution. Yes. She goes for It both. was also a vendor <coughs> potential for that. I think I sent it to you that we might want to look into. I mean, if, if you know, it's an outside agency that pursues that. So maybe give that some consideration. I just got a feeling that there's a little bit left on the table there. Yeah. And it is, we might need to come back and answer this. But so for some jurisdiction, they made a, an agreement where they said Airbnb will in the rate when we pay, Airbnb then cut the check. Is that correct? Rather than the homeowner? So like How is the, that? yeah, so like you're paying it when you pay online. Yeah, yeah. and then eventually, I don't know how they do it, but then Airbnb or whoever handled that send it directly to I the think city. That, could, that, that would be a great thing for us to look into doing. So I think in the past that they had, and so at the time what I had heard from staff was that the number of businesses were, were relatively small and the fee collected from those organizations for collecting the fees on behalf of the city. They thought it was just more cost effective to have Pam a couple times a month go online, do the research, see if there's any new businesses, and continue to solicit them for a business license and their TOT. But we we can revisit that for sure, because that's been, that's dated information. <coughs> and I know that the county just did it, so. Um, yeah, we can talk to them. I do. Well, we were a couple of years ago to now. Yeah. Well, and it, Joe's, the, Joe's number of 99, I think that's higher than the previous numbers that I had heard. Well, that's if you just type in a zip code. You really can't know if it's in the city limits or not. Okay. You know, so it's, it's a really rough number. <laughs> okay. Okay. Move on. Now we're going to talk about gas tax. Um, so we have the new uh, SB1 RMRA funding, which is in green and purple. So that just um, started a couple years ago. Um, and it looks like, so the gas tax was, gas tax was um, trending downwards, but we're looking um, that it should be going up in, in future years. Uh, so it looks like for this year, um, the section 2103 is projected to be much lower than the original estimates, and that was uh, BOE's failure to do a rate increase. They were supposed to en enact one in um, 2018, but they failed to do so, and so um, that was those estimates were reliant on them doing that, which they never did. And so there was new legislation, and the issue is fixed. And so next year. Um, in that code section of gas tax, it will be doubled um, of what we, um, so about 36,000. Um, and then, so it's expected to increase in the next years. So next year we can project um, about 122,000 in gas tax. And in the um, SB1 funding, um, that is about the same as this year. So that'll be about 68,000 for fiscal year 1920. Um, so this is a overview of our budget for all funds. The general fund's about four million. We have 2.5 million in sewer operations, in water 1.8 million, and then roads is 3.0. Uh, two and a half million of those roads funds are those transportation projects that we heard earlier about um, this evening, and so a lot of those are capital projects that we're working on. So here's an overview of our expenses. Um, I know this is a lot of information on a tiny table, but um, the information's also on, in the packet, and there's more reports as well in there. Um, so looking at this, um, just looking, so as of um, 131.19, um, that was as of January, um, those expenditures, and then um, I did some projections to estimate how we're gonna close the year. And, look, and to see really how we're doing. Um, we're seeing some big variances in the ad administration and finance department, and that is largely um, 
salary savings because we're doing a lot more work on the water race uh, water and wastewater rate study and the transportation projects uh, just more more of our time is being focused in other areas um, than what was originally budgeted in the general fund um, we also had um, a, a contract savings with CityGate it was because the entire contract amount was budgeted this year <coughs> and, um, some of the work was done in the prior year and so that was about 20,000 savings there and we also did a telephone switch we switched over um, from AT&T and we got $10,000 savings in the general fund um, then the next department where we see a major variance is building and planning so we've had a lot of increased development this year um, there's a few big projects including tractor supply and the Dollar General or that was the prior year I'm sorry um, De Nova Homes and um, I thought I had the other one and the, I think Mark Twain um, and then we also had uh, flood damage costs from the recent flood in our department there and so those are going to be reflected um, the next in our fire department we're seeing um, some salary savings there and that is due to um, we didn't ha uh, send our strike team out on as many fires as we had budgeted and so with the re the strike team revenue is lower than budgeted and so are the salaries so we're not paying the guys to go out and get the revenue that they're not getting <laughs> um, but yeah have we seen that funding yet or are we still waiting for that to come through um, we've seen some of it come through um, I do have an estimate I, I have a total of all the of all that we've built out and so that amount should be included in those uh, in your reports in the full packet. Um, that's right. I do have it. So the the full amount that we'll get this year will be um, two fifty six, three forty five. So um, I mean that's we haven't received it all. We have received about fifty three thousand to date, um, but those have been built out. Um, and then going down the line the the next uh, biggest variance we see is in the police department and that is um, salary savings mainly from we have a new chief this year and then two vacant positions and that is both both of those are providing us with approximately 240,000 in salary savings is that a net number that takes into account what we're paying the sheriff yes it is So did I go through all of it? So then that brings us to um, an estimated 242 surplus this year in the general fund. This is estimated. This is very preliminary. Um, and, and that is mainly due to the salary savings in, in the police department. Um, so this is our cash position as of uh, our most latest, uh, excuse me, our latest audit, uh, June 2018. Um, our general fund has 1.149 million, sewer 2.5, water 6.7, um, a little bit in roads funds, and then all the other funds combined are about 2.5 million. And so this will um, hopefully be presented by, or it should be. Um, the audit will be presented in the next meeting by the auditor and we'll get that um, so here's the historical general fund cash so we have been slowly building it up um, the past couple years um, we've been having some unexpected savings and w um, we do need to create a reserve policy for our accumulated cash um, just uh, when money builds up we need our strategy on how we're going to use this accumulated cash and some of these could be um, we've talked about these at previous meetings uh, equipment needs technology um, this would be more for like one-time mm -hmm. capital purchases to help further further us um, so we did approve some financial management practices in February and that includes to have a 25% operating expenditures cash reserve so our 
expenditures are approximately four million and so that would give us one million would be our our base amount that we would need and so we're just about of that above that um, our most recent audit so that's the June 2018 number that puts us at about 29 percent um, so then we'll come back with um, to you with some reserve policy um, options or recommendations um, for how we're going to um, use our accumulated cash was that city gates number 25 percent um the reserve? I, I don't remember what number they did that was the number that we brought to you in those practices yeah okay <coughs> Um, so in our sewer operations, we collect approximately 2.5 million in fees, and our operations are about 2 million, leaving us with the balance spent on capital projects. And so um, we had a few projects this year budgeted. We are delaying the downtown sewer main replacement. Um, we have the city and Greenhorn Creek improvement project that we are working on currently. And so um, we'll have more discussion on that on the next meeting. And um, like we talked about earlier, we have the new CIP that we're going to be bringing back as well. So, <coughs> uh, here's the historical sewer funds cash. Uh, we're at approximately 100% of operations. However, this comes with a little bit of caveats. It's three. We are 3.7 million in in debt, so most of this is borrowed cash. We have 1.7 million in pension and OPEB liabilities. And we have, as we've spoken about, we have major cash demands in the collection system. Um, and so our reserve balance is at approximately 400000 as of the last audit. So in water, we have um, approximately 2 million fees collected, 1.4 million in operations, and then the balance is spent annually on capital projects. So major projects this year, we have the... Um, the water treatment improvement plant or water treatment plant improvement um, which is being done by Blackwater and um, that one's about 400 on environmental and design and construction is estimated at 5.4 to 6.9 million we also did the Mark Twain Road water main replacement project this year this that was completed last summer and then um, we we're talking about some new automated cellular meters that are on the horizon and so we'll come back with more information on that. It's a very exciting new thing for us. Um, and so here is the water funds cash. Um, so we're <coughs> reporting about seven million. So we have, we do have three hundred thousand in borrowed cash. It is at zero percent interest. Um, one point seven in um, pension. One point seven million in pension and OPEB liabilities. And so we have 5.9 is the unreserved net position, but that does include 1.2 million in impact fees that are restricted. So um, like we talked about, we're working on the new master plan and CIP. And so we are planning on spending down these funds on our needed capital, um, capital projects. And so um, after going through every all the funds um, and doing projections to the end of the year I believe some adjustments to our budget would be necessary um, so I've summarized them here um, in the general fund they would all be uh, revenue neutral in the community <coughs> development department um, increase our fee revenue and expenditures um, for the increased work that's happening in that department um, uh, the strike team revenue and the salaries um, just be reduced by the amount that we have estimated for the year um, for the sewer and water I did want to increase the sewer fees um, there um, I did talk about this in um, in my staff report about the way that they were budgeted um, so I believe that I projected um, about let me get those numbers I projected we'd be about 118,000 over in sewer funds um, I did want to do my adjustment a little bit more conservative than what I mentioned in the report so um, I'm recommending 75,000 increased in sewer fees um, and in water fees this for the same reason um, 
and then I wanted to remove the depreciation budget and that would be because our budget should be a reflection of our cash appropriations and that way we can reconcile our budget with the um, sewer and water the enterprise cash flow statements in the audit so you have somewhere to reconcile it to that has been audited and is in you know our formal audit um, and then also we had a debt payment in the sewer fund that um, we need to include in our budget so we need authorization for those and then the last few budget adjustments that I have for um, for you um, uh, these are in the roads funds and this is just a lot of this has to do with um, kind of how we've we've changed billing our time to these uh, CMAC grants we get more out of them when we're not billing our staff time there and we have currently budgeted the full projects um, through the consultants um, in the pr uh, capital expenditure and we did have salaries budgeted in the transportation project fund which are um, not being used and so um, these adjustments are necessary to reflect how we're actually um, using those funds uh, it's it is a revenue neutral fund where we just have um, receiving the grant revenue and then um, performing the capital projects so we don't need the extra expenditures um, in the gas tax fund I um, I recommend that we adjust the uh, 2103 gas tax um, to match the new um, the new amount provided by the State Department of Finance and then um, increase salaries to meet the road maintenance demands and and then also reduce the transfer out by the amount not needed there was some transfers between these three funds that um, were included with uh, transferring to provide for the salaries um, I knew I was gonna get <laughs> into this uh, let me know if you have questions about this if you want me to stop and back up this kind of is getting into the weeds right here and I understand some people just kind of um, so definitely stop me and make me go back if you need me to um, and then lastly in the TOT roads fund my recommendation for budget adjustment um, would be to increase the salaries and benefits for the increased work on the transportation projects and um, and then make the other adjustments to balance the fund so that is all I have I know that was a lot let me know if you have questions yes uh, you mentioned the fee revenue with the planning department. I thought a couple years ago we just raised those fees. Are you talking about edited fee increases? So the uh, when she says increased in increase in fees, it's we we have more development projects. We're already we over budget them. by like yeah. seventy thousand okay, dollars. Okay. So we need Thank to you. match the budget okay. to what we've actually received. Okay. Exactly. We're not actually increasing the prices or anything, okay. just on the amount that we've collected. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And confused with that when I yeah. Okay, thank you. Um and then on the Gas yes. Are we still allocating money into the road fund? That yes. Yeah. Okay. The road relinquishment fund? Yes. yes. So that is the one transfer that will remain amongst the roads funds because that one I know needs to go back to the road relinquishment fund. But there was funds that was transferred in. Let me go back to my financial statements. So transportation projects, there was money coming from TOT roads to transportation projects that and I believe that was to fund the salaries in that project but really all the salaries are going to the TOT roads fund and so the money isn't needed to be transferred into the transportation project it's needed in the in the TOT roads fund um, but the the it's 26,967 will remain and that that transfer will remain to the road relinquishment fund yes So, Council, if I might let you know, uh, we just noticed that we did not agendize the budget adjustment. So, um, if if you direct us to move forward with the budget adjustment, we will agendize it at the 19th meeting. Yeah, it will be on consent if it's unanimous. No, that's okay. Is there any public comment or questions? Oh, 
Jack Lynch, 600 South Kirk Ranch Road. I'd like to compliment your treasurer for a superb report. It is the clearest report that I have ever seen in all the time that I've been on the city council. So my hat's off to you if I had a hat. <laughs> The, uh, the detail and the schedules are, 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 are wonderful. I, I just can't praise it enough. And, and I know the council members, I hope, feel the same way because it's a, it's a good report. And I think her style, Emily's style of approachability also stands out so that anyone feels free to ask her questions for, and I know that she would step forward with, with the explanations. I have questions again on water and wastewater. Uh, we're going to end up the projections of $2.8 million in our wastewater funds and $6.9 million in the water funds. The total between those two, which I know you go back and forth with loans, $9.7 million at the end of the year. And, and again, in terms of a presentation, to the public, you have these funds available, and I, I, I would think that some of those funds should be uh, actively being used for projects. For example, that sewer line, uh, a statement is made in here, we're holding off on that sewer line replacement because <coughs> of funds, and because it, it came in higher than expected. If you've got a sewer project where you've got leaks in the I and I and all, all that stuff, you should be going ahead and, and, and spending it because you have the bucks. It's my only comment. You got a lot of money. Should be a, the other one had to do with TOT. I noticed that TOT has dropped 10% in the last two years. You're at $120,000 projected this year versus two years ago. That's a 10% reduction. That's a big number. I hope you're running audits on those guys out there because uh, if, if they don't feel like you're going to audit them, they may not be sending in their TOT money. That has happened in the past. So I'd urge the council members to make sure that the audit is done. And uh, because it's a big drop, I don't understand that one. Thank you. So Emily, Emily, I might have to have you go to a slide, if you could. <clears throat> just, just want a clarification because so many times I hear how much money is in the bank and, and uh, you know we should be spending it. We have lots of projects, etc. So the slide I'm looking for, which described the money in the bank. Gentlemen. No, the it was all the money's in the bank. There you go, cash position. Yeah. So is that all the money in the bank? Okay, so when we talk about all that money in the bank, how much of it is allocated to projects that are in the city being worked on, whether now or over the next year? So she's wondering how, how much is unrestricted right. fund balance? What percentage? You can't go out today and spend all $13 million no. on projects, right? No. Because you have projects in the works, including water and sewer projects and road projects, et cetera. So... Right. And it would also be... A lot of this money will be situations where you are continuing over time to gather money, and until you reach certain thresholds, that money isn't available to be spent. So you're kind of building up until you can fund a project. Right. But it shows on the balance sheet, but it doesn't mean that it can be used for any, any as an example, any water project. It, would, it could only maybe be used for one specific water project, and you have to wait until all the funding comes in in order right. to build it. That's my point, because so many times I hear where we <coughs> see these kinds of reports, and I can appreciate what you were doing here, but it's not like the city has $13 million in the bank today and can just go out and spend money on a bunch of stuff. It's many of these projects are allocated funds, and you're growing some funds, and then, of course, hopefully we have funds set aside for those rainy days that we're having. Um, so I just wanted that clarification that not all of that is ready available cash to go spend right now today. Yeah, and I, and I kind of talked about that um, with, with the water. Oh, 
Um, so I kind of talked about that, especially with the water and sewer funds. When we have those huge liabilities and the debt in the sewer fund, a lot of that needs to go to those debt payments and, for, and in consideration of those liabilities as well. Yeah. And I'll also add on to what Emily said, is in order for you to qualify for bond financing and for you to operate an, an enterprise fund, you are required to, legally to have certain reserves. So several millions of those dollars wouldn't be eligible to be used because you need to have them as a reserve to meet your statutory legal requirements. So while it looks like a lot of money, practically speaking, it's yeah. not. No, it's not. Thank you. Is there any other comment? No? I, I, oh. I'd like to make a comment. If in the water and wastewater area, again, if you look at the documents that are in existence, and it's a terrific amount of reading a council member has to do to get to it, there is normally a relationship of reserves to operating and maintenance budget so that you make sure that, the, say, the water fund has at least 25% of the annual operating reserves. So, in, for example, in the, uh, in the sewer fund, let me just give you an, an idea of what those numbers would be. In the water funds, the operation and maintenance budget is approximately, say, $600,000. That's the annual $600,000. And normally it would be like 25% or 50% of that amount. Let's say you take 50% of 600,000. That's 300,000. That is your legally required reserves to have in the water fund. What do we have? 6.9 million. That's my point. So uh, to, to, the, uh, to your comment, you have to have reserves against your operating and maintenance. So take that into account when you're looking at the reserves that we have. We have very, very large reserves in our wastewater and water funds, well in excess of what I just described. So, and, and I think that when we have our workshop that these will be important issues to kind of bring yeah. forward. Um, I think that what he was speaking about is, is only a portion right. of what you are required to have in, in, in reserves, and it doesn't reflect the whole of what you're required. So you can't look at the at the amount of, you know, if you just use water, 6.7 million, mm -hmm. and then take one operational fund and then say you only have to, that's 600, and so you only have to have 300. One of the challenges that you all have is because you are a smaller city, your ratios are required to be higher mm -hmm. because of the fact that you know, something breaks, it's, it, it, it's just, it's a lot bigger percentage than it would be of a city that, that's much larger that can spread those costs. Um, and that being said, the other consideration here is the ability to have the bond financing. In, in other words, there's going to be security that's required in order to be able to go and get a loan um, so that we don't have to pay immediately. And so you can't just take into consideration what is required by like the water board and so on. You have to take into consideration of what would be required in order to have bonds and not put rates that for the immediate rate holders would be unbearable. That being said, in the communications plan, there needs to be an itemized Absolutely. list of everything that's in the 6.7, whether it's building to yep. a project, whether it's committed to a project, or whether it's just in reserve. <coughs> You know, so that kind of detail, you know, because we throw a number up like that. I get where Jack's coming from. Mm -hmm. It's a big number. There's no detail. Right. There's no there's no timeline or anything. So in the communications yep. plan, it needs to be articulated really clear. Yep. Absolutely. And also, the, um, if something would break on a separate aging system that we have or we're working with, I mean, to fix that, what, is some, what does that look like? In reality, it's a lot. We just had a well go down in Dixon, it was a million dollars. Yeah, so and then emergencies are a lot more expensive. <laughs> okay, so 
I've got notes on all of those comments, and so we plan to bring that back. Back. So, so what do you need on this? So if I could, Mayor, real quickly, if you could yeah. indulge me. There's a discrepancy between the staff report and between the agenda. Um, because it was included in the staff report, um, the request for the budget adjustment, if council would um, like, they could move first to amend the agenda to reflect the fact that um, uh, of the request for approval of the budget adjustments. If, um, if council took that action, we could then move to uh, approve that um, if, if the council didn't want to do it, then if uh, it was a unanimous direction, um, the other way of doing it is just to bring it back and put it on consent for the next meeting. So whichever is your, I just want to give you the options that you have available to you. Is everyone okay with the consent? Move it to consent next time. Yeah. yeah. I'm okay either way. We could, we could. You, well, option one yeah, would be to amend you? today's agenda okay. to reflect. The, the staff report and the actual agenda itself because it meets the legal requirements because it was included in the staff report or in the alternative if you're not comfortable with that we could move it to the consent agenda at the at the next meeting assuming that all four of you are in concurrence to move forward with it uh, well, I think we should just amend if we amend it we're in the same situation we're okay with yes. that now it meets the legal continuing requirements on, yes. meets the legal requirements I would think to amend it is that okay with everybody else yeah, I'll make a motion to do the budget adjustments as a uh, amend the uh, I think we have to first amend the amend. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. so, so what we would be looking for <laughs> would be first, uh, this would be two, two, motions. two motions. So the first motion we would be looking for is to amend today's yeah. um, agenda uh, for item number, because I'm looking at this part. 7F. 7 7F to reflect um, um, as part of that that uh, uh, the request for council approval of the uh, recommended budget adjustments in the staff report. So is there is that motion? I move that amendment. Okay. <laughs> as spoken. Okay. Is there a second? Second. I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Okay. And now. And so now the agenda would reflect that you could also vote as part of this motion for approval of seven F, um, um, to accept the financial report as well as the recommended budget adjustments. Is there a motion? So move. Okay. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 I just want to say thank you very much. No, thank, thank you. you very nice much. Good job. I will, I will also post the slides <laughs> on the website if anybody would like access to those. Thank you. Good job, Emma. Yes, excellent. Um, okay, and on to item A, council reports, and I will start to my left with council member. Uh, <laughs> nothing to report. Nothing to report. <laughs> nothing to report. No, my children's not here. Nothing to report. A um, few things. LAFCO on the 28th of January, I did attend that and uh, just make everybody aware. City of Angels is on the radar for uh, municipal service review and sphere of influence. I understand it's a five year requirement and we've been eight years out, so that could pop up. No schedule for that to happen. I attended uh, the Central Sierra Economic Development meeting on the 21st. Uh, Amador County is now officially back into that organization that was fully ratified by all the members and they were present there. Uh, Terry Woodrow was reappointed as the chair of that group. Marshall Long from Mariposa County is appointed the vice chair. Um, Calaveras needs a citizen's rep as an alternate. Um, it's not on us to figure that out, but the county rep has to. Um, there was an economic development. There's a group of data presented that looked useful to me, so I provided it to Debbie. And, and, and it's a, an issue where Dave uh, Doney has access to this database. And so if you were working some issue, you could contact him and, and um, extract you know, data from the census and data from zip code information, things like that. And then uh, finally they announced a Center for Economic Prosperity opening in Martell. Uh, it's co-located with Motherload uh, Job Training, the Amador Chamber of Commerce, uh, Amador College uh, Connect, and Columbia College in Amador County. The landlord, by the way, is the Jackson Rancheria. So it's a building that's been it's, uh, been constructed down uh, 
down the hill actually from Martell a little bit. It's out in the county there. On the 26th of February, I attended UWPA. The search continues for our new general manager. We're moving along with that. 